I hope everybody's been uh, enjoying Code Boom America 2021. I know I'm very excited to be here and I'm super happy to be speaking to you about a, a topic that I find really personally interesting, um, uh, macaroons and Elixir. Uh, if you know anything, I actually have talked about this once before at another conference. Um, so you guess you could say that we're doing this all over again, but actually I promise if you've seen that talk already, there's plenty more in this one that you'll find interesting, at least I hope. Uh, just thank you so much for that introduction, but I'm just going to go over a quick little bit about me because it's obligatory in the talk world, I guess. Uh, so uh, I go by digit in the community. I am a senior software engineer at a large security company presently. I tend to find myself a, the living definition of a generalist engineer. I have so many side projects, I need like multiple to-do lists. Uh, I really like building tools and libraries. I actually recently uh, released a library called Burrito, uh, which allows you to wrap up uh, CLI tools written in Elixir and compile them to cross-platform binaries. Um, happy to talk about that in the toucan afterwards. I also built a uh, text slash teeks, depending on whether or not it was before or after the Hacker News thread. Um, I also love building tools and libraries. They're probably tools that people use to create things or my favorite things to build. So if you've seen any of my other talks, you know that I like to explore topics. Um, this is no different. This is an exploration into macaroons and elixir, um, along with a few experiments. So uh, really, by the end of this, I hope you just have a new idea of some authorization tokens and some kind of new tokens that can really inspire some new projects, maybe fill in that gap for a project that you're scratching your head on. Uh, really just an exploration of this topic. But let's do a little overview about what we're actually going to talk about. So first, we're going to go over what is a macaroon. We're going to ask, why would you even want to use it? I'll have a quick little demo that actually will pick apart the pieces of a macaroon, and you can actually visualize it. Uh, I'll talk about how they compare to some other tokens in the world. We're going to talk about data log. Don't worry, that'll make sense later. And then I have a really cool uh, smart home demo uh, which is related to the data log. Again, don't worry too much. It'll, it'll be fun when we get there. And then finally, we're just going to wrap things up and uh, go over our conclusions. Okay, so uh, let's uh, waste no time. What is a macaroon? A macaroon is a bearer credential. If you're familiar with JWTs or cookies or API keys, there's something that you present with an HTTP or any other protocol request that authorizes or authenticates a action or request. Uh, they were first introduced in a paper titled Macaroons, Cookies with Contextual Caveats for Decentralized Authorization in the Cloud. It's a bit of a mouthful. The paper is not that long. I highly recommend you read it if you're interested in writing your own implementation of it. It's pretty short and uh, pretty easy to understand. Uh, I had a lot of fun reading it and uh, I recommend. Macaroons are specifically concerned with authorization, sometimes uh, abbreviated AuthZ. This is not for authentication, which is something like I am user one, two, three. This is I have the capability to do this to a certain resource. So these are the capabilities that you have. They're also easily serializable and transmissible. They're URL safe um, and they're not specific to HTTP. So you can really transmit these over any protocol you want. And their core cryptographic primitive is HMAC, which compared to something like RSA or any other kind of like cryptographic primitive is pretty cheap. So it's pretty good for embedded devices. Um, and it also helps provide message integrity and authenticity. So I wanna talk about some of the key features, at least in my opinion, uh, that I think really make macaroons really fascinating. Uh, first off, there's a thing called delegation and attenuation. There's another feature it provides, which allows a flexible definition for your predicates. And there's also easy third party authorization uh, with public key cryptography. We're going to go over each of these in detail in a moment, um, but I just want to kind of prime your brain for these as we talk about them. So keep on watching for these three things as we go. Let's pick apart a macaroon and see what makes them up. So. Uh, Usually tokens are these really opaque things. Um, so I like visuals. So here's a macaroon. The first part of a macaroon is the location. The location is usually a URL, URI. It's just a string that generally indicates where the macaroon came from. 
Next is a field called the public identifier. The public identifier is another freeform field which is service specific. Usually this is used to match the macaroon with its issuing secret key. Uh, this means uh, you can use this to basically do authentic authenticity lookups when the macaroon comes back to your server. But you can really use the public identifier for anything. Uh, that's just the recommended and probably the most common use case. The next part is a little more structured. You have zero to however many you want uh, caveats. We'll define caveats in a moment. The final part is the signature. This signature is computed using HMAC, like we said. There's a secret root key that your server or your service keeps, and it is used to seed a chain of HMAC digesting through every single caveat all the way down to the final HMAC signature. And this final HMAC, HMAC signature is tacked onto the end, and this is what makes up an entire macaroon. To represent this in Elixir, I've actually been working on a macaroon library. You can check it out. It's already on Hex and on GitHub. Uh, here's a type struct that I use to represent a macaroon. Uh, it's really straightforward. There's a couple binaries for the location, the public identifier, and the signature. And there's also a list of caveats. OK, so I keep talking about caveats. What is a caveat? A caveat is a predicate, so something like x equals y. And it has to hold true for the macaroon to be respected. They are used to restrict a macaroon's capability. And this is really important because they shouldn't be used as like a key value to state what a user can do. They should be used to restrict what a user can do. So if you have, say, a file in a post-6 file system, a macaroon with no caveats that represents that resource of a file is basically 777. So like everybody can read, write, and do everything to it. As soon as you start adding a caveat that says the operation has to be read, now you've restricted what that macaroon allows on that file. So this is what we mean by caveats. There are caveats to how you can access that resource that this macaroon represents. They come in two types, first party and third party. So let's talk about first party caveats. First party caveats are really easy. They are just a predicate. In this case, name equals Alice means that this macaroon would only be respected if the, somehow we could prove that the request coming in has a name of Alice. Very straightforward. That's called the caveat ID. And that's it. That's all there is for first party caveats. Pretty simple. Third party caveats get a little more complicated. They are still just a predicate that has to be proven. But they can't be proven by your service. They actually need to be proven by another service. This is why they're called third party. The client actually has to visit another service to obtain proof that that predicate is satisfied. So this is useful for offloading the responsibility of proof to another service. Now we can start being distributed using macaroons. We can say, I need to prove that this user is logged in. I need to delegate that to something else. So you can just put a third party caveat on it, on it that says, this needs to be authenticated. And then the client has to go off and obtain some means of proof. The structure of a third party caveat is relatively similar. Just like a first party, we have that predicate, that caveat ID. There's one key difference. Because we don't want to leak what we want to be proving to anybody but the third party service, we encrypt that ID in a way that only the third party service can decrypt. There's also two extra fields that are in third party caveats. The location, which is a hint to the client as to where it needs to go to obtain this third party proof. So it would be like your authorization server or any other kind of service that needs to provide proof. And then there's a, uh, and that's known as the location. And there's one more field. This is called the verification ID. It's more ciphertext that I'm going to get into more detail about in just a moment. But basically, all it is used for is validating the response back from the third party. So it's, it's a little more complicated. But I'll walk you through an entire loop of authorizing with the third party service. And you'll see that the actual requirements are very low. Here's my Elixir struct for a, a first and a third party caveat. Very straightforward. We have a couple binary, we have a couple strings for our caveat location and our verification key. 
And then we just have an atom that just flips around whether it's first or third party. That's really more of a convenience when you're writing this code. Cool, that was really fun. Uh, why would you use this? I'm sure that's a big question you're asking. In my opinion, one of the biggest features of macarons is attenuation, which is actually the ability to add additional restrictions to a macaroon that has been produced with one key benefit. You actually don't need to contact the original service to add more restrictions. How the heck does that work? Well, because we're using HMAC as our cryptographic primitive, our secret key that's used to encrypt our first, that's used to HMAC digest down our signature in our first caveat, we actually use the result of that in the next HMAC computation. And then we use the result of that in the next HMAC computation, and so on and so on. And so what this means is if you are holding a macaroon as a client and you have this, the current signature, you can add more restrictions and then hand that token to another service and guarantee you that it's been further restricted. This is similar to how when you log into a service and you get that OAuth 2 prompt that says, allow reading your profile, allow reading your email. It's similar to that, but instead of having to speak back and forth to the original service and the third party service, as a client, one HMAC computation is all you need to add a new restriction to a token before you give it to a new service. And now that service can talk to the other service on your behalf, and you know that the restrictions you've added are gonna be respected. It's a really cool feature. Another good feature, I think, is the flexibility, because the format of a caveat can really be anything as long as it evaluates to one of two things, proven or unproven. You could make your caveats x equals y, or you can make your caveats an entire scripting language that evaluates to true or false. Really, there's a lot of possibilities here. Finally, that third party delegation feature. Because if a caveat can't be proven by your party, then you can just delegate that burden of proof to something else. And there's actually very little communication that needs to happen between those two services. I'm gonna to demonstrate to you just how little needs to be shared between a first and a third party service to do this kind of uh, authorization with third party uh, caveats. Let's say you have one application and a third party application. They have a well-known public key and the third party has the private key. Here is our client. We want to give them a macaroon that has a third party caveat that they need to go to this third party service and obtain proof for. So let's pull up our caveat struct for third party caveats. We're gonna fill it out. First, we're gonna generate a random nonce or a random key, a number only used once. We're going to take the predicate we want the third party service to prove and the nonce, and we're going to make a tuple out of them and we're going to encrypt it with the public key. Now, the third party service is the only thing that can open that tuple. Next, we're gonna add the location, which tells the client where it needs to go to get this third party proof. And then we're gonna take that nonce, we're going to encrypt it with the signature at the present time of adding this caveat. And uh, this is so that when we recursively go through all of the caveats later, uh, we can verify that the third party actually unpacked this and got that nonce. Okay, so we add our caveat. This macaroon is now fairly useless, honestly, because it has a requirement for proving third party, uh, a third party caveat, which you know we need to talk to the third party service first. So the client's gonna take off that blue bit at the top. Because the third party has that private key to the public key, we can then unpack uh, that tuple and take out the nonce and the predicate. The third party service can do whatever it wants with the predicate and prove it. And then it's going to mint a brand new macaroon using that nonce as the root HMAC key. This is called the discharge macaroon. This is a totally separate and new empty macaroon that gets handed back to the client. This is a bird, this is a basically a statement of proof that the third party service looked at that third party caveat and said, yes, this is correct. You now hand both macaroons, so the original macaroon and the discharge from the third party service back to your app. You can recursively go through all the caveats and your discharge macaroons, do the HMAC computations, and you now know that that third party service authorized that caveat. 
notice that there was not any communication between the first party app and the third party app. All they needed was a well-known public key. That's it. There was no other communication. So I have a small demo. I'm going to show you how easy it is to create a macaroon and uh, kind of pick it apart a little. So in my macaroon library, this is what it looks like to create what's known as the golden macaroon. Again, a macaroon with no caveats is unlimited access to a resource. So this has no caveats yet. So this is a golden macaroon. All you have to do is pass an identifier and your location and hopefully a better secret than the one that I put in this example. That will return a macaroon struct that will contain the HMAC signature as well as the location and ID. Now we can add some caveats. All of the add caveat methods in my library are pipeable, so you can just make a big chain of these to do whatever you like, or reduce, or do anything you need to do with a macaroon struct to add multiple caveats. In this case, we're going to take our resulting macaroon from the last step, pass it into the add first party caveat, and add a simple predicate that's not really a predicate, but for demonstration purposes, is a string that says this is a first party caveat. The return value will be the same macaroon. However, we'll have the new caveat and the signature will be updated with the new HMAC digest. We can do the same thing for a third party caveat. Adding a third party caveat is also pretty simple. To make things easy to do that RSA key dance that I showed in that diagram, I've actually written some helper methods. Uh, what this will do is it will generate the nonce for you and will be able to take in a public key that you've loaded using Erlang's public key library. Uh, so you can just pass all that in here and it will return back a tuple of the new macaroon with the third party caveat attached and also the nonce it used. And you can store that away for verification later with whatever mechanism you want. And finally, you want to serialize it so you can actually give it to your user. So there's two ways to serialize it in my library. You can either serialize it as binary, which will then return a base64 encoded URL safe string, or you can do the JSON version of the serialization, which will return, well, a JSON blob. That's the macaroon we just minted. It's in the, the deck here. The thing about these are they're really opaque and hard to read. So I built a live view based uh, macaroon inspector that you can actually view. Uh, it's up on Fly.io right now. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to uh, pull that up and paste that macaroon that we just minted right into it. You can see it actually has decomposed it into some components. We can take a look at the location. We can take a look at the public identifier. We can even take a look at what the current signature is, as well as the caveats that will be listed. You can see our first party caveat says this is a first party caveat. And our third party caveat is mostly opaque due to the public key encryption. However, uh, this makes it a lot easier to look at macaroons, in my opinion, because otherwise they're just kind of an opaque string. Uh, if you're on this website, there's even another example you can click this link for and it will give you just an example macaroon so you can pick that apart. This will work with any uh, V1 base64 encoded macaroon. Cool, so that was a quick demo. Those, that's really macaroons in a nutshell. Uh, you can check out my library that's on GitHub and also on Hex, but we're not done yet. Let's talk about something different. Let's talk about something a little more experimental. Let's talk about data log. Yeah. If you don't know what data log is, it's technically a subset of Prolog. Uh, if you saw uh, Quinn's uh, keynote, you will know that uh, Prolog has a very large history in Erlang's heritage. Um, I swear we did not plan this. However, uh, we both did have an interest in talking about it in some way. So I was uh, doing research for macaroons and API authorization tokens in general. And I came across a fantastic article uh, by Thomas Tachek. I highly recommend you read this. It's called API Tokens, a Tedious Survey. It goes over so many different kinds of authorization tokens um, for distributed auth and just goes over JWTs and macaroons and all sorts of things that I haven't even heard of yet. Um, really great article, highly recommended. Uh, I was going through it and it, listed one specific token that I thought was really, really interesting. They're called biscuits. Biscuits, macaroons, eh. uh, OK, so biscuits were actually created by uh, Geoffroy Capri. They were influenced by macaroons. However, they have some differences. 
first of all, they use public key cryptography as their primitives instead of HMACs. So they're a little different there. They're also different in the fact that all their caveats are data log programs, which is very unlike macaroons because they have unstructured caveats. And wait, that means we can embed authorization logic in our token, which sounds wild and also really cool. Um, very ambitious, as Thomas put in, in his article. I was really fascinated by this, and I decided to do a little experiment. I wanted to see if I could encode some macaroon caveats as data log programs. There's no reason I couldn't. Caveats can be anything as long as they evaluate to true or false. So forewarning, this is an experiment from the rest of these slides. Uh, I don't recommend you do it in production, uh, but I think a lot of interesting thinking came out of this. And I want to walk you through uh, exactly what I did here. So I asked the question, what if we encode our caveats using data log? Uh, and I had to be careful because we need to make sure we're adding only restrictions. Uh, we cannot be adding capabilities. We can't amplify because then anybody could add a data log amplification and they could just like make their permissions wild. We don't want that. We just want to add restrictions. So I thought of a really interesting use case. So I was actually talking with Quinn Wilton and uh, she suggested this and I, I kind of ran with it. So imagine a use case where uh, you have a homeowner or uh, a renter and they have a place that has uh, maybe a smart lock and maybe some leak sensors, maybe some thermostats, right? Uh, we can technically just encode all that as facts into a token. And that's a golden macaroon, technically. That's just access to everything. Cool. What if they have a house guest and they're staying for an extended period of time and you only want to give them a subset of access to that, those devices in your house? Well, because we can attenuate macaroons, we can actually do that we can say maybe they get access to two thermostats and a leak sensor. And then we can trust them with this because even if they attenuate their macaroon to other people that they have over when you're not home for some reason, they can only give those guests a subset of their subset. It's, it's a very cool tree of permissions that macaroons or biscuits really allow that I find really cool. Like this, this use case really drove it home for me. So I swear I did not plan this. SmartRent is actually sponsoring CodeBeam. Um, a, a, I, when I first moved into my apartment, I found a SmartRent box in my closet. Um, I had no idea what it was, but then I realized they were actually using uh, Phoenix sockets. So I wrote a small little library uh, on my GitHub that I communicate with a socket and I control the SmartRent devices through my own like IEX and stuff. Um, I hope you don't mind. Uh, I kind of reverse engineered it from a web browser. so. Uh, Ooh, unsupported, but it was fun. So great, I have this use case and I have a library to interact with some smart devices, but now I need data log. Uh, Sean Cribs, who's actually speaking now at the same time slot, uh, wrote data log for Elixir. Uh, and sorry, Sean, I know you very explicitly do not want people using it, uh, but I really needed data log and I needed it fast and it was there. And I really liked your inspect protocol. So uh, I borrowed it. The way Sean's library works is uh, you can basically just write data log as a list of atoms and uh, then you can query it. And it's really easy. So like you can see, I, I make a fact and then I make a query and then I query it in IEX and I actually just get back like the solved result. It's very cool. This is perfect. I need it, this is exactly what I need. So uh, here's what I did. I treated the first caveat that is added as the authority. What this does is this states all the devices on the network. Anything that's defined after this is not respected. This one states these are the devices this token has. Next, I start adding restriction facts. The restriction facts basically can be anything from saying restrict everything about this device or restrict just a few things. In this case, I can say, well, device one is a thermostat. So set the minimum and maximum temperature ranges to these and then restrict everything for all the other ones. And then I write some queries that get tacked on that basically I can say, give me the blacklisted devices, give me the devices that have restrictions, uh, give me just all the devices. Uh, I can just throw this token at a server and with no authorization logic, I can just query this data log program and get back the details all in the token. Very cool. 
And then I do a very fancy thing to get it into the caveat, which is call Erlang.term to binary, and then Jim and Zlib compress it. And then that's my caveat. I have a demo of this, and it works. So I'm going to pull it up, and we're going to see this tree of smart devices in action. So this is Roost. This was a thing I started working on a long time ago. Um, and I repurposed it into working for this. This, uh, this is actually my apartment. These are my actual smart rent devices uh, being listed here. This is my office thermostat. Like I can, I can set the temperature value and it'll, and now that's my heater just clicked on, right? Th this is a real thing. This is real data, um, but I don't consider my apartment production, so. I have this share devices tab that can be pulled out that lets me select the subset of devices I want to give to somebody. So I can actually say, uh, give them access to the bedroom thermostat, but only like 65 to 75. And then I can say they can have access to two leak sensors. Then I can click copy share link. And this has made a really long looking share link. But if I go ahead and throw it into my macaroon inspector, this URL is actually just a macaroon. And if I go ahead and look inside it, you can see the ID, you can see the caveats, which are opaque because they're data log programs, um, and the signature. So that's neat. So let's make a new tab and throw this in here. And I'm only granted a subset here. So now I can only see that thermostat and I can see those leak sensors. Uh, now let's say I have a plumber coming over and I need him to do some stuff on my water heater. Um, I can click share device again, but I can only share the subset of the subset. So I can attenuate this macaroon again, and I can say, well, it only needs to work on the water heater. So have the leak sensor for the water heater only. I can throw that on here. And now we have another attenuated macaroon that only restrict, restrict, scopes it down to this. None of this is stored on the server. None of these permissions are stored on the server. It is all in the macaroon. It's wild. I, I love this feature. This is such a great use case. I got very excited. Uh, so I kind of went all out on this. All right, let's wrap it up because I think I might be running close to time. So uh, quick overview of macaroons again. They're bearer credentials that are, in my opinion, much more flexible than JWTs that use a chain of HMAC signatures that start with a root key. And because of that, you can attenuate permissions without talking to the server. I really want to say, I've worked with a lot of companies. Every time the authorization or authentication comes out, everybody reaches right for JWTs and JWTs have their place. I'm not gonna be the parade that says no more JWTs forever, right? I just want to say, it's important to consider all the other features of tokens that are out there. Please go read Thomas Tachek's article because it really goes over like a comprehensive view of them. Maybe next time you're working on something and you think about the relationship between your users and the resources and how they have to be authorized, maybe macaroons or biscuits might actually be a better fit than a JWT with some other homegrown system thrown on top of it. Really, I just want us as a community to explore different authorization options so we don't just get stuck in the same place. Uh, I think there's a lot of really cool things out there we could be using. That's all I got for today. Uh, thank you so much. This has been a really fun talk and a really fun project to build. Uh, you can reach me on GitHub or Twitter, and uh, I will open source, uh, I'll probably open source Roost at some point, uh, can't promise when, but uh, the Macaroon library is already online and it's ready to go. Excellent. Thank you so much, Digit. That was yeah. so exciting, especially to see the demo at the end. Um, I'm really hooked now, and I feel like I want to set up smart <laughs> devices just so that I can play around with authorization, which is kind of wild. So big thank you for that. And uh, we do have plenty of time, I believe, for questions. So I encourage right. our audience members to ask their questions through the Q&A feature, and I will read them out for us. And uh, I, I have a question to start off with. Sure. You mentioned that uh, you really want the community to stop and consider when we're reaching for authorization schemes. Uh, you feel like oftentimes you've seen teams just go for JOTS right away. Could mm -hmm. you sort of give us a TLDR in your own words? When might you reach for JOTS? When might you reach for macarons? I Yeah, so I, I brought up the relationship between users and resources. Um, if a user, if the mapping is more one-to-one, -one, you probably don't need macarons. But if you're in a situation where 
you have a user that needs to say, do some kind of third party authorization, like, like OAuth 2, right? The amount of times you do a login with OAuth 2 or something and you hand this like box of permissions to somebody and says, they wanna read your email and your whatever, um, you kind of just have to trust that that's gonna work um, and trust that they're gonna obey those permissions. With a macaroon, it's baked in, <laughs> I didn't mean to make that pun, it's baked into the token. Um, to the point where you as the user have the power to just say, add a caveat. Um, I think I, it's really hard to speak in terms of like general terms. I really think that if you have this, that if your resources end up in a tree like that, like the smart home system, that's a good time to start looking at something other than Jots, maybe start looking at macaroons or biscuits, uh, things that allow attenuation. That's the key phrase there is you really, if you need attenuation, um, really look for some other alternative token besides a jot. Um, otherwise, you're going to start having to store like a matrix of permissions on your database, and it's going to get really complicated. Um, I really think leveraging attenuation to macaroons is like one of its big power moves. Yeah, it also makes me think of, um, I feel like it would a classic example maybe be Google Docs, the way you can sort of share with this group yeah. of people. They can edit, they can comment, or whatever. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. cool. Exactly, yeah. Another example I always thought of was uh, the, the Steam game client uh, has this ability to share libraries. And the current way they do it is you have to like log into each other's computers and do this weird like authorization dance. Really, you could just like hand somebody a macaroon that just says like, here's a subset of the library for this long amount of time for like this amount of like games or whatever. And I think there's like, that's another example um, where you wanna share a subset of resources that a user has. And now that you mentioned that, I'm thinking of like other gaming examples where you want to send someone like a link to join a certain yep. game that you're playing and then they can only access it, uh, you know, are only authorized to do certain actions. So once once I'm starting to think about it, I'm thinking of like a million reasons why yep. to reach yep. for this. Um, I have another question for you. If mm -hmm. any of our audience members are like me, very excited to check this out in greater detail and want to build something using macros, do you have any suggestions of where to get started? Any resources? Yeah, um, so definitely read uh, Thomas Tachek's article first. Um, even if you just skip to the section of macaroons, um, there's a really good just explanation of what they are. Um, I also really suggest taking a look. There's a lot of implementations. Um, Lib macaroons is a C implementation. That's like one of the first ones. That one's a little dense, but it has a really big readme that goes over like every little detail. Uh, I would also recommend taking a look at some production examples. Uh, the matrix chat client, uh, or the matrix chat protocol actually uses macaroons and either Snap or Apt uses macaroons for like some kind of authorization. I think it might be Snap. Um, they, they use macaroons, they use the Python macaroon library. Um, so there are a lot of implementations that you could go take a look at. Uh, but yeah, definitely check out that article, check out the readme for lib macaroons. Um, and you know, just read through implementations uh, there and the paper. Honestly, if you're not too bothered by like some of the math notation in the paper, uh, there's pseudocode in there that it makes a lot of sense, and I, I think it's a really practical paper. All right, thank you for those recommendations. We do have another question from an audience member from Alex Lopez who asks: You said the permissions are all in the client. If the client is in control of permissions, what security measures must be taken to prevent a bad actor from adding unwanted permissions to the macaroon? Okay, yeah. So a big key thing about caveats is they're, as per their definition, they should only be restrictions. Um, it's really up to you to write your service so that they only parse the predicates as predicates. Um, basically, it's a rule that a caveat should not be amplifying a permission. They should only be scoping the macaroon further and further down. So the only thing a bad actor could even do if you designed your macaroon properly is make it less accessible. Um, so you just want to make sure when you're designing your authorization system with a macaroon that things you're adding to it are caveats that are scoping down the macaroon uh, rather than saying, uh, if you have a directory of files and you have a macaroon that represents a sharing a file in that directory, rather than saying they can access file name this, file name that, file name that, you could say instead uh, they can only access uh, this file. It's the like whitelist versus blacklist theory, right? 
um, you want to make sure you are scoping down from full permissions, not going from no permissions to full permissions. And I think that actually nicely also answers another question that we had from an audience member who said, is there a way to revoke permissions of a macaroon? Um, okay. But yeah. yeah, so revocation can, revocation, macaroons don't really attempt to solve revocation because revocation is just a problem you have to solve. What a lot of people will do is they'll make the macaroon expiration time very short um, so that even if they're out in the wild, um, the amount of damage they could do if you want to revoke them is minimal. The other option is, of course, you could uh, use the public identifier as a way to revoke an existing macaroon by having a list of blacklisted macaroons. Of course, you have to then maintain that list. But again, they're not attempting to solve revocation, but it is certainly possible. Yeah. 